Many scholars believe that the psalm we're going to look at today is the oldest psalm in all the Bible. And the reason it's believed to be the oldest is that the writer is Moses. We're in Psalm 90 today, Psalm 90, Psalm 90, if you have a Bible, go there. And Moses is probably one of the most unique characters in all of Jewish history and all of the Old Testament. Most of you know Moses' story. He's born as a Hebrew slave in Egypt, born at a very difficult and oppressive time for the people who were there as Jews serving as slaves to the Egyptians. And at that time, they were multiplying in great number within the borders of Egypt. And the Pharaoh decided, out of a sense of security, out of a sense of probably paranoia, these Hebrews are multiplying. They're filling our land. They might come up against us and defeat us within our own borders. So he had an edict. He had a command, if you will, to put to death the firstborn male child at this time of all the Hebrews. So Moses' parents, now having given birth to this newborn son, this male child, came up with a strategy. They built a little ark, if you will. They built a little basket, and they took Moses and placed him in it and took him down to the Nile River. I think they knew when Pharaoh's daughter would be bathing, it's probably not too hard to understand that she would come down to the Nile. She was childless with her handmaids, with her servants to bathe. And Scripture kind of defines and describes Moses as a beautiful child, good to look upon. And so she's there, and there's Moses, and the the reeds are the bulrushes, if you will, in the basket. And she finds him. She sees him. And knowing his plight, that he's one of the Hebrew children that's destined to be put to death, she has compassion on him. She falls in love with him. And so Moses goes from being condemned to die, a refugee, if you will, at birth, to the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He goes from living in fear of of death with his parents to, well, living in the home of the man who said, I want his life to be taken. So Moses grows up in a palace, a life of privilege, a life of purpose, a life of wealth. And at the age of 40, when he's been living this amazing life, he realized who he was. He was a Hebrew and that he could no longer live the way he was living, realizing that he's not an Egyptian and his own people are suffering under the whip of the Egyptians, building their cities, their burial places, forced to do slave labor, those pyramids. So at the age of 40, he rose up. And on a certain day, he saw one of the Hebrew slaves being abused. You guys know this story. And he killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand, And he thought certainly when the Hebrew people saw, his own people saw that he was taking the lead and stepping up, that they would all rally behind him and he would be their great leader. But they didn't. In fact, they asked him a question. Who made you leader or ruler or judge over us, Moses? And suddenly Moses realized he was all alone. And so instead of being an infant, who was a refugee, now he is an adult, 40 years old, and he flees into the desert. He runs for his life, if you will. And there in the desert for 40 years, another 40 years, Moses lives, not as a prince, not in a palace, 
but as a hired herdsman, a nomad, going from place to place, living in tents and lean-tos out in the scorching desert, hiding, cut off from his own people, both Egyptian and Hebrew. And then God comes and reveals himself to Moses in a miraculous way. And he causes Moses to go back to Egypt, back to where it all began, and to do things he probably never dreamed possible. Life was pretty much over for him when he ran into the desert. But God says, I want you to go back. I, I, I want you to deliver the people out of Egypt. And I want you to do it this time by the strong arm of God, not within your own might, not within your own strength. And so he does. You guys know the story of Moses. You've seen the movie even, most likely. He parts the sea. He, he takes them out into the wilderness. And, and, and Moses stays out there again for, for 40 more years, wandering with the people. Criticized. Overburdened many times with decisions and issues, struggling to lead, and his life actually ends in that desert. He never enters the promised land God has for them. The great man Moses goes from palace to desert, from prince to shepherd, herdsman, to leader and deliverer. And in his life's journey and all that he accomplished and all that he went through, this thing called life with all its circumstances and difficulties and blessings and miraculous things that happen, he takes some time to share with us his thoughts about God, about life, about the journey that we're all on as we walk out this thing that God has given us, this thing called the breath of life. And there in chapter 90... Verse 1 and 2, he begins to share what it's like to live your life. He said, Lord, you, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God, you've been our dwelling place. Or to put it maybe in our vernacular, our words, God, you've been my home, my resting place. You're where I live my life, not in a palace, not in a desert, not in a tent. God, in reality, you have been my home. You have been my security. In fact, you've been all mankind's home from the beginning, from everlasting to everlasting, God. You're our roots. You're our source. It's like the Apostle Paul says in the book of Acts, in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our very being. And Moses, long before the Apostle Paul says that, puts it in these words, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. When we give our heart and when we give our life to him, when we surrender, when we reach the place where we finally say, God, I give up. I come home to you, that's when we find true rest, a sense of belonging, a sense of I'm now home. God, you've been my dwelling place. Jesus put it this way, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll be your home. I'll be the place where you find security and strength. I mean, the world's a beautiful place. And you can travel to all kinds of places and see beautiful homes, houses, all over the world. But we all know this. They're temporary. They collapse. They burn. They wash away by storms. They don't really offer security and safety and strength that we truly long for. God says, I'm your forever home. Now, that's the big term these days. I'm going to build my forever home. Good luck with that. God, you have been our dwelling place in all 
generations. He's our forever home. He's our refuge, the Bible says. He's our strong tower. In him we find our comfort. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, there's a, there's a sense of chronology here. There's a reflecting back, I believe, of Moses to that Genesis creation story where he talks about the mountains and the earth and the world and from everlasting to everlasting. It's like he's looking back on that story and he's watching the, the, the God of all creation create this whole universe that we live in. Eternity, the world, the earth, the mountains. You might say, John, aren't, aren't the earth and the world the same thing? Well, no, God created the world, if you remember the story, and it was covered by water. And then he created the earth, the dry land, and then the mountains. And Moses says, God, before the mountains, before the dry land, before the world, God, you go back to eternity, to, to everlasting and everlasting without end. God, you've always been there. And you're our true home. You're our origin. You're the God of history. You're the God of creation. You're the God of eternity. No beginning and no end. Moses is, is lived his life as he's writing this. And he says, as I look back, it wasn't the palace. It wasn't the desert. God, it was you. So vast, so powerful, my source, my roots. In you I find my life, and you I find my existence. You turn man, verse 3, to destruction and say, return, O children of men. Or some, some translations say, you turn man to dust and say, return, O children of men. God is our creator, and he has everything under control. God, when you say return, things return. When you say stop, they stop. God sets boundaries in our lives. From the very beginning, he did that. He said, Adam and Eve, there, there are certain boundaries I'm setting for you. Now, now you have a free will to walk past those boundaries, but then there's also boundaries he sets for us that we cannot go past any way possible to do it. He allows certain things. You know, there was a time when, when man would never have even imagined of going into space. And what, what they, they couldn't consider, there was no automobiles, there, there were no, no, you know, powered ships. Uh, but, but now... That boundary's gone. And I think God said, well, God, we'd, we want to go to space. I think God said, well, if you can figure it out, yeah, go to space. And so man figured it out, goes to the moon. He builds space stations. He's got satellites and telescopes and spends trillions and trillions of dollars and God says, how was it up there? We didn't find that much up there. A few rocks. We dig around in genetics. And God says, well, if you want to do that, okay, be careful, though. There's gene splicing, and we might create a weird sheep or two. There's viruses and proteins. And God, we said, God, we want, to, we want to split the atom. We, we want to go past that barrier. We want, to, we want to create nuclear power. I said, be careful. Don't blow yourself up. But if you want to go there. But there are some things that God says absolutely no to. No, you're not going. I'm not allowing you to go through that barrier, that boundary. And one of them, in verse 3, he says, you turn man to destruction, to dust. And you say, return Oh, children of men. 
One of the boundaries in life that none of us can do anything about is time. We can't stop it. We can't suspend it. Or we create movies, you know, back to the future, time travelers. But we can't slow it down. We can't speed it up. I'd love to be able to control it, wouldn't you? But we can't. The pages keep turning. The seasons keep changing. The clock keeps ticking. And this thing called time, this mysterious phenomena that none of us can break that boundary, well, it seems to capture all of us. And, 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 and time's mysterious. As a child, it, it seems so slow. I can remember, you know, as a child waiting for Christmas, it seemed like it took forever for Christmas to come around. Even the night of Christmas Eve, my brother Yancey and I would be in bed together, and we had this bunk bed. We'd crawl in, we'd try to keep each other awake. Stay awake, stay awake. The clock would tick ever so slowly. We even would put our feet together and hands and rock back and forth. We're not going to sleep. We're not going to sleep. <laughs> Probably bumped our heads and knocked each other out is what really happened. But time would move so slow as a child. Math class in high school, algebra, I don't know if you remember this, 20 minutes seemed like an eternity in that class to me. It's like, oh my God, I hope she doesn't call on me. But 20 minutes at the beach goes by in a second. Time. God has appointed time. It's an interesting phenomenon. The scripture says that, that a thousand years in God's eyes is like one day. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past and like a watch in the night. God controls time. We can do nothing about it. And in Hebrews chapter 9, it says, it's appointed unto man a time to die. God says, return to dust. It, it, Moses says it like this, Lord, you, you've been our dwelling place. We come from you before everything. And you say to man, return, O children of men. God has an appointment with you and I one day where we go back. He knows the day, he knows the time, he knows the place. I have no clue, neither do you for the most part. But the Bible tells us he's appointed a time. You might be here today, you're, you're, you're healthy, you're strong, you, you got plans for this year, maybe vacations, uh, you're, you're thinking you know, about what you're gonna do even after church. Like you're maybe going to lunch, you might be sitting here right now and thinking, how much time does this sermon take? You know, that kind of thing. Time. But there's a point at a time for all of us. How much time do I have? I don't know. You, know. you could leave here today and be riding down the highway and say, oh, look, there's Popeye's chicken. Go in there and buy some red beans and rice and a, some crispy chicken and a biscuit, and you order an extra biscuit so you can eat that before you get home and your wife wouldn't know you ordered that extra biscuit. <laughs> Not that I would ever do anything like that. And, and, you, and you choke on that biscuit. <laughs> and you never make it home. That biscuit's got your name on it. It's appointed unto man wants to die. We think, for the most part, most of us do, man, I have all the time in the world. Yet there will be a time when God says, return, time's up. We don't understand our old times, but we're, we're so controlled by it. Scripture declares there is the time when Jesus will return. And the disciples constantly wanted to know, Lord, what is, what is the time? And when will it be that you'll establish your kingdom? And Jesus said, well, it's not for you to know the time. In fact, I, my father's the only one that knows. But, but there is a time. In, in 1 Corinthians, it says this about, about time. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We'll not all return. We'll not all die. We'll not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. 
In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. You might be here today like me, and you go, wow, time has flown by. I still can't believe I have 12 grand. I can't believe I'm a grandfather. I'm like, who are these kids? What happened to my little kids? A thousand years to God is like a day. Someone asked God, God, if a thousand years to you is like a day, what's a million dollars like to you? He said, oh, it's a penny. He said, God, could I have a penny? He said, in a day, give me a day, I'll get it to you. <laughs> Time. I mean, the psalmist describes the brevity of life. He says, for a thousand years, verse 4, in your sight are like yesterday when it's past. You carry them away like a flood. They're like a sleep in the morning. They're, they're like grass which grows up in the morning. It flourishes and grows up, and the evening... It's cut down. It, it withers. Suddenly life is over. It's short. You know, I'll never forget on uh, Valentine's Day, 2011, I got a phone call. My older brother, pro surfer, healthy as a horse and out in California surfing, county line, Talked to him about five days before he left, and everything was great. He was always out paddling or surfing, always had an apple in his van. He ate an apple a day. He said, John, apple a day keeps the doctor away. I said, wow, that's, that's, I've never heard that. And uh, he, he loved being outdoors, loved surfing, but there was an appointed time, appointed day. Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2011, he suddenly was called home. What a shock. We traveled together to Mexico, to, to Hawaii, to California, up and down the East Coast. And even today, it's like, wow, it's hard to believe that that part of my life is over. Ten years ago, his time was up. And, and we see this over and over again with great men and women, sports figures. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, I think it was about a year or so, we all witnessed the tragedy of Kobe Bryant, that great basketball player who, who crashed in his helicopter. And it was a guy, he was just so young, it just, it just got out of his career and was living his life with his kids. Actors and politicians and musicians. I, I read a book a couple of weeks ago that uh, was written by a pastor, Greg Laurie, on the life of Johnny Cash and the, 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 the life he had in and out of you know, Christianity and how he sang at Billy Graham Crusades and this, this amazing impact he had on the world of music. And we're on this timetable, all of us living within the sovereign control and the appointed boundaries that God, had, God has placed, and there's nothing we can do to change it. Oh, we can go to space. We can split the atom. Uh, but, but we don't do anything about our, our, our time. God, God's in control. In, in fact, the next verses, which, which kind of disturb me, and I want you to look at them, verse 7, for we have been consumed by your anger. By your wrath we're terrified. You have set our iniquities before you. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. You, you see everything. You know all about us. Our comings, our goings. And, and there is a side to life. I, I think if you've lived a, a certain amount of time at all, there's a side to life that's hard. There's a side to life that's a battle. And there's tragedies. I mean, we, we, we've all witnessed in the news the, the condos that collapsed and the, the difficulty that those friends and families have gone through, children abducted, drownings on Pensacola <laughs> Beach, car accidents. There's no way to escape the fact that many times life has its struggles, right? I mean, we all traffic through them. M Moses says it like this. You, you set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your 
countenance, for all our days have passed away in your wrath. John, are you saying that God causes all these things? That that's his wrath? No, no, I'm not saying that, but, but I do think, listen, that there are consequences that you and I are impacted by because of man's fallenness and disobedience. A man one time lived in this just beautiful paradise, and God said, here's some boundaries I'm setting for you, and if you go past them, there's consequences. And part of that is the wrath of sin. Now, now, now know this. It's not like God's some uptight, hot-tempered deity in the sky. He's not that. You know, he, he, he's not like watching and you know, waiting he, that, that he's going to you know, deal with you like he sees your secret sins. Now, how many of you have secret sins? Right? No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. <laughs> you got that biscuit. <laughs> or whatever it is. It's not like God's uptight and, you know, sick of all this going on. Says, okay, let's send him a little pandemic. Let's see what happens. Let's have a mudslide over here and a drought here and a hurricane there. Okay, let's see how they... No, I don't think that's God's heart. According to Scripture, when man chose to disobey, to, to, to go through certain boundaries, that that sin had consequences for all of us. Did you know this? Listen, that we all impact one another with our actions. They say, no, no, I just live my own life. I do my own thing. It doesn't bother anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's my business. It doesn't affect you. Really? Well, don't put any gas in your car on Blue Angel weekend and run out on the bridge. See how many people love you <laughs> and aren't impacted by you. you. You take a boat by my house, and I don't live on the water, but if I did, your wake impacts me. And that's true in life. We impact each other by our choices that we do each day. We change our culture. We either, we either create good or bad. We all impact one another day by day. God allowed the consequences of disobedience to impact all of us. And it creates all kinds of hardship. We live in a fallen world of evil and people who practice evil. But God is gracious, and he's kind. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows my secret sins. He knows yours. And in this psalm, Moses is describing this, this thing called life and, and how to walk out this journey and recognize who God is. And he says in verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, if you're really healthy... Now, they're 80, yet their boast is labor and sorrow. He says, we, we can live to be 70 or 80. That, 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 that's a lifespan, normal lifespan. We, we maybe have, through medicine and different things, increased it into the 90s, right? But then you don't remember anything, so what's the use? I mean, <laughs> so, but, but that's kind of the, 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 the generic age. 70s, late 80s. I mean, think about that. And even when you get to your 70s or 80s, you, you fear the mirror. You know, I went to the dermatologist the other day and cut something off of me, and I thought, wow, there goes a part of me. And the older you get, the further you stand back in the morning from the mirror. You think, oh, I look all right. I don't understand why women have these ultra-magnifying mirrors. That's a, what, what is that, like torturing yourself? Like, oh my God, look at that. Why would you have a mirror like that? And, and if you go to a high school reunion, how scary is that? You walk in and you, you scan the room. Is that Frank? 
The quarterback? Mr. Pensacola High School? He's fat and bald. Is that him? <laughs> the script, scripture says 80, maybe. Not changed much since that day. God sets boundaries. You and I are living in this temporary dwelling, and Moses is trying to show us, trying to tell us, someone who's been there, hey, God's your true dwelling place. He's your security. He's your home. You can trust in Him. Verse 11, who knows the the, the power of, of your anger, for as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us, he says, to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. We, we, we can't ignore, or we should not ignore the, the consequences of our actions. Why don't we respond? We shift the blame to other people. Oh, that, that, that's their, they, they caused this, and I'm, I'm innocent, and, and we, we're never guilty. It's always someone else. God, help me see my limitations, is what Moses is saying. Teach me to see life as it really is. It's short and to be wise and and to know that my true home is you and to number my days. That's what he's saying. God, you're my home. My life is short. Teach me to recognize that. And to be wise in carrying out this brief little life that I have. So he, so he cries out there in verse 13, Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early. This is a key verse. Satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad All our days. Here's what he's saying. Listen, let me have your attention. God, don't let me waste or ruin my life to be unwise with the years that you gave me. Help me, help me number my days and, and, and Lord, satisfy me early in life. Let, Let me find you in my youth. Let me not wait till I've lived my life. God, let me know you, here's what he's saying, and be satisfied with you. There in verse 14, oh, satisfy satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. The word satisfy in the Hebrew means make me steadfast, not give up. To be content in you. And verse 15, I I love this. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us. The years in which we have seen evil. Let's look back on our past. Let us recognize we didn't know. And rejoice how you have forgiven us. And how you have been so faithful to us and what you've done for us in our lives. Make us glad according to the days in which you afflicted us. I mean, I can look back on my life and I did a lot of stupid things, made a lot of mistakes, burned a lot of bridges, dropping out of high school at 16, not even attending my own mom's wedding when she remarried after she'd been divorced for so long, thinking I was so independent and wise. But I can also look back and see a new life that I was given in Christ at the age of 18. And I can see favor and I can see joy. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. I think of the writer Joel when he wrote his story of Egypt, I mean of Israel and their 
their disobedience and their consequences and how God said to them, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. And God can do that. God restores. That's amazing that he, he plants, he sows. He, he does what we could never do to regain what we lost. He brings it back in an amazing way. Let your work appear to your servant, verse 16, and your glory to their children. I love that. God, God don't stop just with me. Let it be in my children's life. You know, saved at 18, and I never would have thought God would have given me a godly wife. I met her in Bible college, and he gave me three children. He, he, he for some reason, allowed me to, to, to be a pastor and plant a church in my own hometown. He gave me 12 grandkids. Well, what a different life my kids have gotten to have versus what I had growing up. We, we didn't go to church. We, I didn't have parents who prayed with me. I, I, I don't ever remember my dad saying, hey, I remember the day I dedicated you to the Lord. Oh, that didn't happen. But, but my kids have lived a totally different life. I remember holding like, like I held uh, little Madison this morning, each of my own children before the Lord, like with a crowd like and saying, Lord, we want to dedicate this child to you. Neil and Jenny and Ryan. I got to officiate all their weddings. <laughs> Can you imagine? This 8, 16-year-old high school dropout selling marijuana is now doing this. It's an amazing thing. I took all my kids to Israel one time. Had them in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed. And I laid hands on them with my beautiful wife, Lynn, and I prayed, Lord, not our will, but yours be done. And we specifically prayed for their marriage partners when they were 13, 14, 16 years old. And I think of the pastor they grew up with. What an amazing gift they had to grow up <laughs> under that ministry. <laughs> what a life they had. Phenomenal. This verse, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God desires to do something in your life, in my life, in our lives, in your children's life, in your children's children's life. Maybe you say, well, I don't have kids. Well, then in your friends, in your family, in your church, in your associates, let your works appear in your servants. Now, 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 now let me have your attention. Here's Moses. What an amazing life that he lived. He would have never dreamed that God would have done what he did in his life. But God did some amazing things. In verse 17, it says, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. What makes him beautiful? Well, I would submit to you not just his mercy, but his truth and his love. God will never lie to you. God will never stop loving you. God will never turn his back on you. How beautiful is that? How, how wonderful is that? You know, we talk about beautiful people. We talk about, you know, uh, actors and actresses in Hollywood. Oh, they're so gorgeous. They're so beautiful. They're nipping. They're tucking. They're creaming. They're Botoxing. They're <laughs> plucking and liposucking. You know, they're doing all this stuff. And they're beautiful. But a beautiful person in Scripture is not so much the outward Although there's nothing wrong with that, but truth, a person who walks in it, who speaks it, who lives it, a person of love, a person of character, a person of heart, God will tell you the truth about you in a loving way. If God were a man and he was married and a woman said, God, do I look fat in these pants? 
God can't lie. He would say, wear something else. Because <laughs> God tells us the truth. You and I would cower from that. We call it wisdom. God speaks the truth. He'll say to you and to me, John, you're a sinner. Friends might say to you, oh, that's okay. That's not so bad. You're, you're okay to do that. And God will say, no, no, it's not okay. It's time to stop. It's time to stop deceiving yourself. It's time to be forgiven. God will give the truth. And then offer his love and then offer his grace and offer his mercy and say, you can come to me and find a home. You can find rest. You can find security. I will give you forgiveness. Let the beauty of the Lord, his love, his truth be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I'll establish the work of your hands, God says. In other words, Moses is saying, you come home to God. You make him your dwelling place. You, you recognize that he sets boundaries and there's consequences and difficulties in life. And he says, you come to me, I'll give you truth and love and mercy and forgiveness, but I'll also give you purpose and I'll establish the work of your hands. I'll make your life count. I'll give it meaning. That's what Moses is saying. A life of significance. I can, God says, establish the work of your hands and you can be involved in something that's not just temporal, but that lasts forever. See, we all desire, I think, deep inside to be involved in that which is real, that which matters, and that which has beauty to it. I mean, think about Moses out there on the desert watching sheep getting old, probably poking a fire at night, thinking, what? What in the world did I do? I was a prince. I was living in a palace. I had my own chariot, a boat on the Nile. Now I'm out here on the backside of a desert kicking sheep dung. And suddenly God appears. Moses. Let my beauty be upon you. Let me establish the work of your hands. Moses, you have no idea what I've planned for you. Parting the Red Sea. Moses, you, you go from a dung kicker to a Red Sea parter. How, how amazing is that? Is that amazing? You're out in the kicking dung and watching stupid sheep, and all of a sudden the bush is burning, and God says, Moses, come home. I'll establish the work of your hands. That's pretty heavy stuff. Finds himself on the mountain, face glowing, the hand of God writing on tablets. I mean, this is powerful, amazing, incredible stuff. He's going to see fire by night and cloud by day and manna falling down from heaven. Moses, I'm going to establish the work of your hands. It'll be meaningful, it'll be valuable, it'll be enduring. And it won't be just you, Moses, but you and I. You do your part, Moses, I'll do mine. And if you let him speak the truth and share his love, if you make him, if I make him my home, my rest, my life, my forgiveness, he will satisfy. He'll fulfill. He'll give you a sense of what's talked about here of steadfastness and purpose. Because one day, listen. One day our appointed time comes. But from the time you're born to the time that you find him and to the time your appointed time appears, God can give a life worth living, a forgiven life, a life with beauty and establish. Jesus, come to me. Make me your home. Come home, he says. I'll establish you. I'll change you. I'll satisfy you. And if you're here today, you don't know him. He would say to you, I want to invite you in to my home. I want you to come home to me. Let me be the one who establishes the work of your hands. Let me be the one who forgives. 
like Moses. You're on a journey. You can't control this crazy thing called time. God has set boundaries. And for each one of us, whether we like it or not, the pages are turning, the seasons are changing, the clock is ticking, and that time awaits. And God says, but you don't have to live in fear of it. In fact, while you're living that life, well, I love the way Moses puts it, make us glad. Let your work appear and your glory to the children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That's what he does. In the appointed times and boundaries as he set upon us. O Lord, Moses says, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. You're it. You're the man. Lord, help us to recognize who you are. 